Hello, health champions. Today we're going to talk about the top 10 best morning drinks for diabetics. And if you're not a diabetic, then let's keep it that way. And these drinks can be highly beneficial for general health also, as well as keeping you from becoming a diabetic. And number 10 on the list, and these are not necessarily in rank order, number 10 is vegetable juice. And this is not to say that this is something you should drink in the morning. It is if you're in the habit, if you feel like you have to start the day with some juice, like you've been having orange juice all your life, then you want to replace that sugary juice with something else. So you want to make it a green juice and you could base that on something like celery. Celery is fairly neutral. It's not as bitter as a lot of other greens. You can also put in some cucumber and then you want to add in some leafy greens. So this could be romaine lettuce, it could be spinach, could be iceberg lettuce, arugula, anything that you like or even kale. And the reason I say even kale is that it's pretty potent. And if you do a lot of any of these leafy greens, especially the kale, then they'll become kind of bitter and take over. So you probably want to base it on the celery and some cucumber and then use the others sort of sparingly, at least until you get used to it or know what flavor you're dealing with. But the thing we want to keep in mind is that plants, they do have some beneficial compounds, but some of these compounds are only beneficial in very small amounts. And they can be there because the plant is trying to defend itself. So it's like a mild toxin. And that can have certain benefits, but it can also overdo things so we get too much. And if you start reacting to things here, especially the kale, and you also want to be careful with the spinach, because it can tend to develop kidney stones because it has a lot of oxalate. So realize that some of these things can be beneficial in small amounts, but if you react, then you're getting too much. So don't feel like you have to have a bunch of these things or that more is better just because someone called it a superfood or put it on their list. So the most important criteria is, does it make you feel good? Because you should drink these and feel really, really good. And if you don't, then figure out what's in there that you're not doing so well with. Number nine on the list is a smoothie. And again, this is not something you have to have. If you watch some of my videos, you will notice that I talk a lot about eating fewer meals, doing intermittent fasting, and very often just skipping breakfast. But if you're in the habit of having breakfast, you might as well make it a good one. And a smoothie can also be great if you want to make something and take with you to have something on the go. And if you do, then you could put protein powder in there, but a lot of people, they just put water and protein powder and they call that a smoothie. I would say it's optional. If you have one you really like and has some good ingredients, not a bunch of artificial stuff and chemicals, then you can use it, but it's not necessary to put a protein powder in there because you can get protein from other things. And I'd like to base it on, you put some water in and then you can add on some milk, some cream, half and half, or coconut cream. This will provide some protein, but also some good natural fats to give you energy. Then I'd like to flavor it with cocoa powder. A lot of people will put fruits and berries and bananas and things in there. And if you like, you could put a little bit of raspberries, for example. But for the most part, fruits will add a bunch of sugar, which if you're diabetic, you're trying to get away from. And cocoa powder is very, very low carbohydrate. And then you want to put in more of the bulk of the smoothie. So you put nuts and seeds especially if you don't do a protein powder, then you'll get the protein from nuts and seeds. But in the nuts and seeds, you also get fat and fiber. So these could be things like pecan nuts, walnuts, and the seeds could be things like chia or pumpkin seed or flax seed. And then of course you want some sweetener. And if you don't put a bunch of fruit in there, you want the sweetener to be stevia or monk fruit because these are non-calorie sweeteners, but they're not artificial. They're natural 
products so you can use them safely in moderation. And what I have found is if you sweeten something with cocoa powder and stevia, it'll taste a little funky until you add salt. So these are the three things you want to balance out, cocoa powder, stevia, and salt. And play with those until you find a, a good flavor that you like. Another nice flavor to add is a little bit of vanilla if you like that. And you can make these to be completely ketogenic to where you have 5% or less of the net carbs from carbohydrates. Another thing you can use is chia water. And this would be a good idea if you feel like you have to have something, you're a little hungry, but you don't want a full meal or you're trying to cut back, then make some chia water. It's very, very simple. You put about one tablespoon of chia seeds, about 10 grams, into a cup of water. You wait 20, 30 minutes or up to an hour if you want it really kind of gel-like. And what this can do for you, it, it can help provide some satiety. It'll fill you up a little bit. These seeds will swell up to a gel, so it provides kind of a filling effect. And it has a lot of good fiber. So this fiber is mostly soluble. And that soluble fiber acts as a prebiotic. It acts as food for the beneficial bacteria in your gut. It also provides a good amount of essential fatty acids. The one that you're getting the most of is ALA, alpha linolenic acid. Now that's not instead of a fish oil, but the body can turn some of this ALA into the EPA and the DHA that you find in fish oil, but the conversion is kind of limited, so you don't want to rely only on this. And chia seeds are also jam-packed with vitamins and minerals. Just realize that you're not going to get a substantial percentage. You're going to get a, a good portion of some of them, but not like all your vitamins and minerals because you're only consuming 10 grams worth. Number seven is black coffee. A lot of people cannot start their day without some black coffee. And I am totally okay with a small amount, like one or two, maybe three cups of coffee per day, especially early in the day. Just don't let it get to where you sip coffee all day long. And when a lot of people have black coffee or a cup of coffee, they want to add something. So they talk about they want to have some cream with it. But cream means different things to different people. And I want to compare some of the different things that people usually put in coffee and show you what a difference it is. So if we look at skim milk, whole milk, half and half, and cream, and realize that if you like coconut cream, then that falls closer to the cream end of things. It kind of falls between the half and half and the cream. But if we now, if we look at the fat component, and we're talking about the percentage of calories from fat, in skim milk, it's only 7%. So with skim milk or fat-free milk, there's a, just a trace amount left. So there's not really any calories from fat to speak of. There's some protein, but what we're concerned with is that in skim milk, 55% of the calories come from sugar, from carbohydrates, from lactose. So if you're a diabetic and you're just having some coffee in the morning and then you fill it up with skim milk, because skim milk doesn't taste very much, it doesn't whiten the coffee very much, so you'll probably be tempted to put a quarter cup in there to make a difference. Now you're going to get quite a bit of sugar. You're going to get a sugar spike early in the morning. Not as bad as if you actually added sugar, but that milk sugar still has an effect. So instead of skim milk, if you use whole milk, the percentage of calories from fat jumps to 50% right away. There's some protein, and then you have 29% of the calories from carbohydrate, but that's dramatically less. If you see here, there's almost 10 times more calories from carbs in the skim milk than the fat, whereas in whole milk, now we have more from fat than from carbohydrate. And this is sort of how nature intended, because there's no mammal that drinks skim milk from their mother. They 
put mostly fat in because that's where the energy should come from. And then if we go up to half and half, which sounds like it would be half milk, half cream, which it really isn't. It's more like three parts milk and one part cream. But still, the fat percentage, the calories from fat jump to almost 80%, less protein, and now we only have 12% of calories from sugar. So it's a dramatically different food because the black coffee is neutral. It's just basically water. It has no calories. So the calories you're getting is from what you're adding. And there's a tremendous difference, as you can see here. You're going from a high sugar food to a very low sugar food. And you think it might be almost the same thing. And then, of course, if you go to cream, now we're talking 36, 37, or even 40% fat. 95% of the calories come from fat and only trace amounts, like 3% of the calories are from sugar. So now, again, we're going from a high carb food to a high fat food. And if you're using cream, heavy cream or half and half, you can probably get by with a tablespoon. Whereas with skim milk, if you put a tablespoon in, you hardly notice there's anything in the coffee. So as a diabetic, you want to understand the difference here so that you don't load up on high sugar foods, that you load up on low carb foods. And this little extra fat is gonna have a few more extra calories, but it's good calories that keeps your blood sugar stable. And next on the list is green tea. So everything we talked about so far has some calories, and then you wanna choose something that's low sugar. The rest of them really have no calories at all. So how do they differ? Well, they have different amounts of chemical compounds. A lot of them are gonna have things like polyphenols. And the a type of polyphenol is catechins. And if you read a long, big, boring paper, they will also tell you that they contain epicatechins and epigallocatechins and epicatechin gallate and so on. And the words just get longer and longer. So please, don't memorize any of these. I certainly won't. And what we want to understand though is that they've done the research and we know that these plant compounds have things in them with certain properties. So they are usually antioxidants. Almost everything that they talk about, they'll throw in antioxidant as a property. But realize that that's not the main thing that you're looking for. Your body makes most of the antioxidants that you need. And the intracellular antioxidant that really matters is called glutathione. So that's not the main thing that we're looking for in the plants, but when they are antioxidant, they usually have also some anti-cancer properties, some anti-inflammatory properties, some antibacterial, et cetera. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. But what you don't want to do is try to memorize which foods and which drinks and which herbs have which chemicals in them because that just gets way too complicated. And that's not what we're looking for. Number five are herbal teas. And here you can go with just about anything. Some examples are chamomile tea, peppermint tea. You can do ginger or cloves in the tea. Those are all very nice. And among the herbal teas, I also wanted to list cinnamon tea because you could make tea from that. And in addition to a lot of the things they have in common, like antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, antifungal, antiviral, cinnamon has also been associated with blood sugar control, blood sugar regulation. And as a diabetic, that's the number one thing that you're looking for is to stabilize your blood sugar. Number three is turmeric tea. So you could take turmeric as a supplement, you can eat it as a whole food, but you could also make tea from it. And again, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, that pretty much holds true for, for all of these, antifungal, antiviral. But now we wanna ask, who is this for? And I'm not talking about what type of disease would you have for this to be suitable. I'm talking about, is this really for the human? When you eat this, are you really taking it for you? And as it turns out, probably not. Because what they have found is that turmeric really isn't absorbed 
at all, hardly at all. And most of these polyphenols that we're talking about, they're too large to be absorbed. There's a few of them that are super tiny. So we absorb somewhere between five and 10%, but the vast majority of all of these polyphenols and all these beneficial plant compounds that we're talking about, they're not absorbed. They never make it into the body. So how is it then that they do research study after research study and they find all these benefits? How can they be antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, all of this good stuff if we don't absorb them? And it's because they're not for you they are for your microbiome. They have certain properties that either fight off or build certain bacterial species in your gut. And then when your gut is healthier, then it benefits you. So we probably don't need plants at all. Chances are, and I'm not saying this as an absolute, but the more we learn, about these things is that most of the plants and all these plant compounds, they probably benefit the balance of microflora that we have, and that is why we ultimately benefit. So it's really kind of funny or sad, if you will, that with turmeric, they have for years, for decades, they have been working on trying to make it more absorbable they add things like black pepper and they attach little chemical compounds and they make it super, super expensive so that we can absorb it, but we're not supposed to absorb it. It's not supposed to be absorbed. It's supposed to stay in the gut and help the microflora. And we're probably gonna find more and more examples and evidence of this in the coming years that a lot of the things that benefit us never really make it into the body. Number two is lemon water. And lemon water can help reduce kidney stones. That's a great thing because lemon contains citric acid that binds with the oxalates, like things in spinach. That's not the only place, but spinach, for example, have lots of oxalate that tend to contribute to kidney stones. And then lemon with the citric acid helps because it binds with the oxalates and carry it out so it can't form a stone. And just don't expect any miracles because if you squeeze a little lemon wedge in, that's probably not enough citric acid to make a big difference, but again, every little bit helps. It can also be a digestive aid. And how does that work? Well, it is all about the pH. And I have to laugh here because I saw a video that tried to explain this and they said that it's all about the pH and they said it was the benefit was because the lemon and the citric acid raised the pH, which of course is the exact opposite. It's acidic, so it lowers the pH, but they kind of had half of it right because the pH is what makes this mechanism work. They just got it backwards. So a low pH will stimulate the hydrochloric acid production and it will activate the pepsin in your stomach and something called CCK, cholecystokinin, that makes the gallbladder contract. So every little step kind of signals the next step so we have a complete process. Another thing that lemon water does, the acidity again, it inhibits amylase. And amylase is the primary enzyme that you use to break down carbohydrates. So in your saliva, it's called salivary amylase because it starts already in the mouth and you release this and you start breaking down carbohydrates. So you get a jump start on the carbohydrate breakdown. Well, if you're diabetic, that's not something you need a jump start on. You already have trouble to keep that blood sugar down. So if you have some acid, and this inhibits, it puts a stop on that amylase, it means that you're gonna prevent blood sugar spikes. This carbohydrate is gonna be released much slower. So again, it's important that with this, we reduce the blood sugar spikes, but it's still the same amount of carbohydrate. 
So if you're carbohydrate intolerant, which you are as a diabetic, then you want to do both. You want to reduce the spikes, but you also want to reduce the number of carbs. So it's not enough just to delay it. It's still too much carbohydrate for a diabetic. And furthermore, if you do this in the morning and you don't have any other food with it, then there is no other food to slow down. So then this point is kind of moot. It doesn't really make a difference. So while there are some potential benefits, don't expect any miracles. It's not going to turn your health around by itself. The number one reason to use lemon would be that it tastes really good. And that's why I use it in just about everything. A little squeeze of lemon makes a big difference. And number one on the list of good things to drink in the morning if you're diabetic is apple cider vinegar, ACV. And the reason it's a little different because lemon juice is also acidic, but this acid comes from acetic acid. That's what gives vinegar its properties, its taste and characteristics. And it also contains polyphenols like a lot of the other things, so plant compounds that can help with inflammatory things and antibacterial and so forth. But the main thing that sets this apart is that there are numerous studies that suggest that it improves insulin sensitivity, that given all other things being equal, that it still helps people reverse insulin resistance and improve insulin sensitivity. And so in studies, they have found all other things being equal, that it does have make a difference in reducing belly fat, in reducing blood sugar, that long-term blood sugar called A1C. And in doing this, it's all about the insulin that you reduce the belly fat and the A1C and so forth. It also reduces blood pressure and cardiovascular disease and most of the risk factors associated with metabolic syndromes. So unlike lemon, the number one thing to take apple cider vinegar is probably not that it tastes so good. I think very few people would drink it just because it tastes good. I like it on salads and in food. I use vinegar freely in different types of food and it doesn't really matter if it's apple cider vinegar or some other type of vinegar. It's the acetic acid that makes the difference. So if you like it, use it. If not, maybe cook with it or find some other form of uh, acetic acid. But here's a little bonus for you and I'm sure that you were already thinking in these terms that if these things that we can drink have certain benefits, then what if we combine them? And you're absolutely right. So why don't we make our chia water and then we squeeze some lemon and we flavor it with cinnamon. Now we have like three different beneficial things in there. That's totally okay. Or you could make your herbal tea with cloves and ginger and you can put in lemon and peppermint and all sorts of other things that you enjoy. Mix and match and see what you like. But the most important thing to understand about this is to get perspective on it. Yes, all of the things we talked about are beneficial. Yes, all of them are better than something else that a lot of people are using, but don't think about them as medication. Too often when I see a video or I read a list someplace, they're described as medication. They say, take this for that. If you have a headache, if you have high blood sugar, take this. That's not how it works because they're not addressing the root cause. They're assisting your body. They're giving your body a little nudge, but they're not undoing the root cause. The root cause is that you've overloaded your body with sugar and carbohydrates and processed foods. And there's nothing that can undo the bad that you have done. You have to take that out and then you can add all the things we talk about as little nudges to assist your body and guide it on the way to healing. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.